Hello and welcome back to another episode of Seven Minutes of Sport. I am Christina, your host throughout season one of this podcast, and I am joined today by James Lloyd, who is the deputy head of Mountford Chambers Regulatory Practice Group and a member of the Sport Resolution Safeguarding Case Management Panel. Today, we are absolutely delighted to be welcoming Richard Bush, who is a partner in the Media, Entertainment and Sports Group at Bird and Bird in London. Now, as many of you will know, Bird and Bird is a leading sports firm, and Richard has experience of advising a wide range of sports organisations, including national and international governing bodies, event organisers, uh, clubs and right holders, He was also recently appointed to the Gymnastics Ethics Foundation's Appeal Panel. He is incredibly talented and we are very lucky that he has given up some of his time to be interviewed by us today. Richard, hello and welcome to the podcast. Hello, well I'm very flattered to be called very talented. Um, (laughs) So I've taken aback in fact, but anyway thank you very much to Christina and James for having me on. It's, uh, It's a pleasure and I look forward to our conversation. Not at all. We're delighted to have you here. Now, just before I hand over to James, just an explanation, Richard, I do this in all the episodes uh, to explain to our guests. I have a timer here, which I use to strictly regulate the seven minute discussion. So the only question left is, are you ready for me to press go? Please do. Crack on. Lovely. In which case, James, over to you. Richard, your first question, and we'll run through these quickly if we can, is... Can you briefly explain to us the decision in Yves Jombard and FIFA and why it's been seen as so controversial? Yeah, so bearing in mind the brevity, it is a case that concerned um, very serious allegations against Mr Jombard. Um, he was acclu- accused of abusing his position and the sexual harassment and abuse of various female players, including minors. Um, he was... Um, that, those charges were found proven at first instance, and then at CAS on appeal, the decision was overturned. And I think, again, but very briefly, it's viewed as controversial for two reasons. One is the outcome itself, because a lot of people involved, including Thief Pro and Human Rights Watch, who helped investigate, obviously believed the allegations. And there was also concerns that the uh, witnesses and alleged victims weren't handled appropriately, effectively. So two main reasons that it's considered controversial. And we're going to come on to discuss an article that you've recently written on this topic. And you look at the uh, the topic of safeguarding and how to approach cases such as this from a different angle. But what is the difference between uh, ordinary disciplinary proceedings and safeguarding proceedings? Yeah. So in a nutshell, um, with disciplinary proceedings in sport, we're generally concerned with sanctioning inappropriate or misconduct. So take anti-doping, anti-corruption, data, you know, more general misconduct in sport, things that are against the rules. Whereas with safeguarding, we should look at things, certainly in my view, through a slightly different lens. We're not, we shouldn't necessarily be concerned with punishing wrongdoing. What we're concerned is taking the term literally, safeguarding, protecting people from risk. So the question becomes not someone's committed someone's broken the rules let's punish them and sanction them the question is this person presents a risk of harm to others and we meet we need to manage that risk within the sport so the question is is this person a risk of harm if so yes and if yes what protective measures do we need to take to pre- prevent risk within the sport which can obviously range from kicking them out of the sport to things like education awareness how they behave themselves going forward so it's a, it's a, it can be, admittedly, obviously it can be a fine distinction because if someone's abused someone, ultimately that's why they're a risk and you can adopt both approaches, but hopefully I've explained very briefly the difference between the two. You have, and one of the key differences between disciplinary proceedings and safeguarding proceedings that you identify is the standard of proof. C- can you help us with what the standard of proof was that FIFA had to meet Uh, under the Code of Ethics in the disciplinary proceedings? Yeah, so FIFA had to meet the comfortable satisfaction standard, which is a common standard in sport, particularly for more serious types of offending. So anti-doping adopts that standard, anti-corruption will typically adopt that standard. 
Um, and obviously, in this case, the FIFA Code of Ethics adopted that standard. Um, that standard operates, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners will know, on a sliding scale between the balance of probabilities and beyond reasonable doubt. Difficulty being, in that case, obviously, the more serious the allegation, the more it moves the scale towards beyond reasonable doubt. Um, so that that was the um, standard in the Yves Jean Bart case. Sorry, and comfortable satisfaction with the standard. And more generally, in safeguarding proceedings. And in safeguarding proceedings, my I, my view, and I, I, I'm not sure that anyone would disagree. If we're if we're concerned about is someone at risk of harm to others in sport, then it should be balanced with probabilities because it follows if someone is probably a risk of harm, then we should definitely be looking to manage that risk. So it's lower. Um, it's the balanced probabilities, and that that I think has to be the appropriate standard in a safeguarding context. And what other differences do you think we should pursue? about, for example, the selection of panel members or the treatment of witnesses in safeguarding proceedings or proceedings that involve safeguarding concerns? Yeah, I think the main, the main thing to understand when we're, when we're talking about selection of panels in safeguarding cases is they need to have an understanding of the effect that trauma can have on, on, their, on evidence, effectively. So first, the two, and there's two main aspects to that. Firstly, when someone's being abused, that is obviously a traumatic experience that can affect how they recall the incident when it's happening at the time. Secondly, a particularly cruel aspect of the abuse can be that when they recall the evidence later on, they cannot give an account that would be considered credible by kind of ordinary standards. Um, so that those are the key reasons why we need to have trauma-informed panels. It's not to say that evidence witness and evidence cannot be challenged obviously it has to be in order for proceedings to be fair but it's doing so with that knowledge and understanding in mind and bearing that in mind when panels are considering cases and would you say then that a disciplinary focus is more reactive or proactive in its stance i think a well there's a lot don't and also don't get, get me wrong there's a lot of Sport is, as you well know, geared up more, certainly domestically, it, to have adversarial processes. So that aspect, there's a debate as to whether inquisitorial approach would be more appropriate in safeguarding cases. But what you can do, if you've got an adversarial safeguarding process, the key points, and I think, sorry, I missed the, this aspect of your previous question. You can adopt such things that are, of course, taken from the criminal law anyway, special measures. So evidence being given behind screens, voice distortion. It's not such a special measure nowadays, I suppose, post the pandemic or since the pandemic, but witnesses appearing remotely, evidence being given at a different time, people being accompanied by someone they trust whilst they're giving evidence and, and, a, and a variety of measures such as that. Actually, Christina, those are all of the questions I had. Have no, we... well, that is fantastic because we have five seconds left on the timer. So that was excellent timing Richard thank you so much for coming on to be interviewed by us I'm sure I can speak to, for everyone including all the listeners when I say that was really interesting discussion and um, for all of those listening who do want to know a bit more information about this please do go and find Richard's article online and have a read I know I found it very informative when I did um, so Richard is there anything else you'd like to say before we end this podcast have me. I suppose one one thing that comes to mind with a smile on faces, I'm going to add timekeeping to the talents you mentioned earlier. But um, no, I think the main thing for this is that I think people, I want people to understand the difference between safeguarding and discipline. And I think that's a key message. And what I would say is domestically, um, I think that distinction has been understood for a long time. I think it's less well understood at an international level, but the direction of travel for safeguarding in international sport is certainly moving in the right direction. Um, and there's a lot of good initiatives underway. So a positive note to end on, I think. Absolutely. James, anything else from you? All I would add is that I always say that there is plenty of lessons to be learned from other regulatory regimes. And some regimes, particularly healthcare regimes, domestically and internationally, uh, education and teaching regimes, do safeguarding, if you want a, a better term, very well. And there is a key difference, in my view, between different regulators and their approach, that those that are reactive, that respond to criticisms, allegations, and those that are proactive, that embed 
processes and measures in their in entire proceedings and in their ethos. There's always a balance to be had, and some regulators are better at it than others, but there are certainly lessons that can be learned from different fields. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, in which case that brings us to the end of this episode. Richard, once again, thank you so much for coming on to join us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you. Uh, for everyone listening, do join us next week. We have one guest coming on. Um, we won't spoil it by saying who, uh, but make sure to tune in then.